À présent, nous allons retransmettre en direct la séance extraordinaire du Conseil de sécurité de l'ONU sur la situation au Moyen-Orient et avec à leur tête, bien entendu, le conflit entre Israël et Gaza. What President Lula is underscoring is that we are dealing with both a hostage and a humanitarian crisis. The acts of terrorism carried out against civilians in Israel resulted in over a thousand victims and the abduction of hundreds of innocent people, including children and the elderly. Three Brazilian citizens have been confirmed dead victims of Hamas attacks. We, as we deeply mourn their passing, we cannot condone acts of terrorism. Violence only breeds further violence. I want to make an appeal, therefore, for the immediate and unconditional release of all civilian hostages in safety, in particular of women and children. Acts of terrorism are heinous and criminal, and international law is clear on the ways to address it. The Security Council has created a significant body of counterterrorism norms. When counterterrorism efforts disregard basic norms and principles, including on the use of force, they reinforce rather than counter the narratives of terrorist groups. Hence, as an effective strategy to address the terrorist threats, it's imperative to ensure full respect for human rights, humanitarian law, and refugee law. Children must always be treated primarily as victims in a manner consistent with the right, their rights, dignity, and needs. The escalating violence in Gaza is also unacceptable. So is the demolition of civilian infrastructure, which resulted in the destruction of 42% of civilian housing. We cannot tolerate the loss of over 2,000 Palestinian children, As the occupying power, Israel has a legal and moral obligation to protect the local population under international humanitarian law. The recent events in Gaza are particularly concerning, including the so-called evacuation order, which is leading to unprecedented levels of misery for innocent people. The number of trucks with humanitarian aid that cross the Rafa border is utterly insufficient to meet the basic needs of the local population. The entire territory is without power, continues without power supply, impacting the work of health personnel. Hospitals are operating beyond full capacity. Access to drinkable water has been impeded, and many are resorting to improper sources of water. Civilians must be respected and protected at all times and everywhere. All parties must strictly abide by their obligations under international humanitarian law. And I highlight in this respect the fundamental principles of distinction, proportionality, humanity, necessity, and precaution, which must guide and inform all actions and military operations. Distinguished delegates, We must not lose sight of the root causes of this conflict. Oppression, social and economic inequalities, recurring violations of human rights. 2023 marks 75 years since the beginning of the Israel-Palestine conflict. It is disheartening to see the lack of progress in the peace process between Palestinians and Israelis. The stalemate in the peace process has been fueling an unsettling rise in violence. Even before the crisis in Gaza, 2023 was already the year with the highest death toll since 2005. The situation in the West Bank remains tense, with successive harmful incidents escalating into violence and leading the civilian casualties. The surge in shelter-related violence is also alarming. Achieving peace requires a strict adherence to international law, as well as working towards realizing the two-state solution. As clearly stated by this Council, the continued occupation of the West Bank is unlawful and undermines the prospects for peace. 
Israel must stop all settlements activities in the occupied Palestinian territories, including East Jerusalem. The difference of treatment towards settlers and locals is unacceptable. The current and projected expansion all but erases the viability of a future Palestinian state and engenders violence and hatred. We also underscore the importance of preserving the historic status quo at the holy sites in Jerusalem and acknowledge the significance of the Hashemite custody. Brazil urges all parties to exercise maximum restraint and abstain from provocations, including the use of extremist rhetoric. Intra-Palestinian reconciliation is also pivotal. We acknowledge the meetings in Egypt focus on exploring reconciliation efforts among Palestinian factions. We encourage the continuation of diplomatic engagements to regional peace processes. Brazil praises UNRWA's invaluable humanitarian work for one of the world's most vulnerable refugee populations, the Palestinians. And we mourn UNRWA's brave workers who lost their lives in the line of duty since the beginning of current hostilities. Our commitment to UNRWA is reflected in our availability to hold the vice chairmanship and the chairmanship of the agency's advisory commission from July 20, uh, 2024 and July 2025, respectively. Distinguished delegates, the broader Middle East has long been entangled in a web of conflicts. These conflicts lead to immeasurable suffering, grief, loss, hardship, and worst of all, hopelessness. They also severely destabilize the region. Now we see the very concrete risk of the crisis in Gaza spilling over to other parts of the region. Amid all these daunting challenges, diplomacy and dialogue remain as our most powerful assets. The maritime dispute between Israel and Lebanon has been peacefully settled through negotiations. Similarly, the recent rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and Iran underscores the potential of good faith engagement. The establishment of diplomatic relations between Israel and Arab countries also show the willingness to engage and cooperate. Such endeavors bring hope on peace in the region. The League of Arab States plays a vital role in this context by working tire tirelessly to mediate and foster dialogue between conflicting parties. Distinguished delegates, the Council has a crucial responsibility in the immediate response to the unfolding hostage and humanitarian crisis. Much of the reputation of the United Nations depend on its approach to the ongoing crisis. Since 2016, the Council has not been able to pass a resolution on the situation in the region. Obstructive strategies have been impeding the crucial decision on international peace and security be taken. As a result, the situation in the Middle East is by far one of the most thwarted issues in the Security Council. This Council must be up to the challenge before us. We will likely be tried and found guilty by future generations for our inaction and complacency. We must find ways to unlock multilateral action. Focusing on disagreements will not lead us to the direction of much needed solution to the unfolding dire hu human crisis. The Security Council should not shy away from its responsibility of calling for the liberation of the innocent people abducted from their families, as well as for their safety, well-being, and humane treatment. This is a broad political call for the opening of urgently needed humanitarian corridors. A decision on the humanitarian aspects of the current crisis is within a hand's reach of the Council members on condition that we refrain from politicization of the already complex situation on the ground. Brazil will continue to promote dialogue among members and action on the part of the councils through the opening 
of possible avenues of negotiation. In this spirit, President Lula instructed me to attend the Cairo Peace Summit the past Saturday with an a, unequivocal message to add Brazil's voice to all those who are urging calm, restraint, and peace in the region, despite the various positions of the member states they are represented, consensus was possible on four major aspects as follows. The end of violence, the implementation of ceasefire, the establishment of humanitarian corridors, and the full endorsement of the two-state solution. Enough of strife suffering and instability. We need all stakeholders to see their own interests through new lenses with long-term and far-sighted perspectives. We need solutions, no matter how political dif politically difficult they may be. A peace and prosper prosperous Middle East is to the benefit of all of us. Thank you. I shall now make I shall now resume my function as President of the Council. I now give the floor to His Excellency Anthony Blinken, Secretary of State of the United States. Mr. President, thank you for convening this ministerial and for convening this Council. And thank you very much, Special Coordinator Wendersland, uh, Deputy Special Coordinator Hastings, for your important briefings. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, we're grateful for your leadership in this incredibly challenging time, particularly in helping get humanitarian aid to civilians in Gaza. And to the entire UN team, their incredible bravery, their dedication, uh, all of those who continue to serve in some of the most difficult circumstances imaginable, uh, we express our gratitude and our admiration. I'm here today because the United States believes that the United Nations, and this Council in particular, has a crucial role to play in addressing this crisis. Indeed, we put forward a resolution that sets out practical steps that we can take together toward that end. The resolution builds on many elements of the text that Brazil put forward last week. It incorporates substantive feedback that we received from fellow Council members over recent days. It also draws heavily on the views that I heard firsthand from partners across the region after Hamas's appalling attack on October 7, views that the United States shares. First, we all recognize the right and indeed the imperative of states to defend themselves against terrorism. That's why we must unequivocally condemn Hamas's barbaric terrorist attack against Israel. Babies riddled with bullets, young people hunted down and gunned down with glee, people, young people beheaded, families burned alive in a final embrace, parents executed in front of their children, children executed in front of their parents, and so many taken hostage in Gaza. We have to ask, indeed it must be asked, where is the outrage? Where is the revulsion? Where is the rejection? Where is the explicit condemnation of these horrors? We must affirm the right of any nation to defend itself and to prevent such horror from repeating itself. No member of this council, no nation in this entire body could or would tolerate the slaughter of its people. As this Council and the UN General Assembly have repeatedly affirmed, all acts of terrorism are unlawful and unjustifiable. They're unlawful and unjustifiable whether they target people in Nairobi or Bali, in Luxor, Istanbul or Mumbai, in New York or Kibbutz, or Kibbutz Berry. They're unlawful and unjustifiable, whether they're carried out by ISIS, by Boko Haram, by al-Shabaab, by Lashkar-e Taiba, or by Hamas. They're unlawful and unjustifiable, whether victims are targeted for their faith, their ethnicity, 
their nationality, or any other reason. And this Council has a responsibility to denounce member states that arm, that fund, and train Hamas, or any other terrorist group that carries out such horrific acts. Let's not forget that among the more than 1,400 people that Hamas killed on October 7 were citizens from more than 30 UN member states, including many of the members around this very table. The victims included at least 33 American citizens. Every one of us has a stake. Every one of us has a responsibility in defeating terrorism. Second, we all agree on the vital need to protect civilians. As President Biden has made clear from the outset of this crisis, while Israel has the right, indeed the obligation, to defend itself, the way it does so matters. We know Hamas does not represent the Palestinian people, and Palestinian civilians are not to blame for the carnage committed by Hamas. Palestinian civilians must be protected. That means Hamas must cease using them as human shields. It's hard to think of an act of greater cynicism. It means Israel must take all possible precautions to avoid harm to civilians. It means food, water, medicine, and other essential humanitarian assistance must be able to flow into Gaza and to the people who need them. It means civilians must be able to get out of harm's way. It means humanitarian pauses must be considered for these purposes. The United States has worked relentlessly to make real these principles. We continue to coordinate closely with Egypt, Israel, and partners across the region, as well as with the United Nations, to build mechanisms that will enable sustained humanitarian assistance to flow to civilians in Gaza without benefiting Hamas or any other terrorist group. President Biden appointed one of our most senior diplomats, Ambassador David Satterfield, to lead our humanitarian efforts, which he is currently doing on the ground. The United States has committed an additional $100 million in humanitarian assistance to Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank, bringing the total aid that we've provided to the Palestinian people over the past two and a half years to more than $1.6 billion. That makes the United States the largest single country donor, by far, to the Palestinian people. We call on all countries, particularly those with the greatest capacity to give, to join us in meeting the UN's appeal for the humanitarian situation in Gaza. At the heart of our efforts to save innocent lives in this conflict, and in every conflict for that matter, is our core belief that every civilian life is equally valuable. There is no hierarchy when it comes to protecting civilian lives. A civilian is a civilian is a civilian, no matter his or her nationality, ethnicity, age, gender, faith. That's why America mourns the loss of every single innocent life in this crisis, including innocent Israeli and Palestinian men, women, children, elderly people. Muslim, Jews, Christians, people of all nationalities and faiths, including at least 35 UN staff members. That's why it's imperative that we work to protect all civilians in this conflict, to prevent more deaths atop the many that have already occurred. The value we place on civilian life is the driving force behind our efforts to secure the release of hostages held by Hamas and other terrorist groups in Gaza. I, as others have, had the occasion to meet with families of those missing and suspected to be in the hands of Hamas on my recent trip. Several, as you know, are in this room with us today. None of us, none of us can imagine the nightmare they're living, something no family should have to endure. Their loved ones must be released immediately, unconditionally, and every member of this council Indeed, every member of this body should insist on that, insist on that, insist on that. We're grateful to Qatar, to Egypt, to the ICRC for helping secure the release of four of Hamas's hostages, but at least 200 more, and again, from many of our nations, are still in the grip of Hamas. So, again, I implore every member here. Use your voice, use your influence, use your leverage to secure their unconditional and immediate release. Third, 
we're all determined to prevent this conflict from spreading. This goes to the principal responsibility of the Security Council, maintaining international peace and security. A broader conflict would be devastating, not only for Palestinians and Israelis, but for people across the region and, indeed, around the world. To that end, we call on all member states to send a firm, united message to any state or non-state actor that is considering opening another front in this conflict against Israel, or who may target Israel's partners, including the United States. Don't, don't throw fuel on the fire. Members of this Council, and permanent members in particular, have a special responsibility to prevent this conflict from spreading. I look forward to continuing to work with my counterpart from the People's Republic of China to do precisely that when he visits Washington later this week. Now, it is no secret to anyone in this room or on this Council that for years Iran has supported Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, and other groups that continue to carry out attacks on Israel. Iranian leaders have routinely threatened to wipe Israel off the map. In recent weeks, Iran's proxies have repeatedly attacked U.S. personnel in Iraq and Syria, whose mission is to prevent ISIS from renewing its rampage. So, let me say this before this Council, and let me say what we've consistently said to Iranian officials through other channels. The United States does not seek conflict with Iran. We do not want this war to widen. But if Iran or its proxies attack U.S. personnel anywhere, make no mistake, we will defend our people, we will defend our security swiftly and decisively. To all the members of this Council, if you, like the United States, want to prevent this conflict from spreading, tell Iran, tell its proxies, in public, in private, through every means, do not open another front against Israel in this conflict. Do not attack Israel's partners. And we urge members to go a step further. Make clear that if Iran or its proxies widen this conflict and put more civilians at risk, you, you will hold them accountable. Act as if the security and stability of the entire region and beyond is on the line because it is. Fourth and finally, even as we address this immediate crisis, we all agree that we must redouble our collective efforts to build an enduring political solution to the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians. The only road to lasting peace and security in the region, the only way to break out of this horrific cycle of violence, is through two states for two peoples. As President Biden has underscored from day one, Palestinians deserve equal measures of security, of freedom, of justice, of opportunity, of dignity. And Palestinians have a right to self-determination and a status of their own. Now, we have no illusions about how hard it will be to achieve a two-state solution. But as President Biden has said, we cannot give up on peace. Indeed, it's precisely in the darkest moments, like this one, that we have to fight the hardest to preserve an alternative path to show people, making it real, improving their lives in tangible ways is possible. Indeed, it's necessary. We've heard many countries express support in recent weeks for a durable political solution. Our message today is this. Help us build that solution. Help us prevent the spread of war that will make two states and broader peace and security in the region even harder to achieve. Members of this Council, we stand at a crossroads. Two paths lie before us. The difference between them could not be more stark. One is the path offered by Hamas. We know where it leads. Death, destruction, suffering, darkness. The other is the path toward greater peace, greater stability, greater opportunity, greater normalization and integration, a path toward people across the region being able to live, to work, to worship, to learn side by side, a path toward Palestinians realizing their legitimate right to self-determination and a state of their own. 
Nothing would be a greater victory for Hamas than allowing its brutality to send us down its path of terrorism <coughs> and nihilism. We must not let it. Hamas does not get to choose for us. The United States stands ready to work with anyone, it's ready to forge a more peaceful and secure future for the region, a future its people yearn for and so deserve. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank His Excellency Mr. Blinken for his statement. Now I give the floor to Her Excellency Mrs. Catherine Colonna, Minister for Europe and Foreign Affairs of France. Monsieur le Président, je remercie le Secrétaire Général et son représentant personnel et coordonnateur spécial des Nations Unies pour le Moyen-Orient, ainsi que son adjointe, d'avoir informé notre Conseil. Et je salue l'engagement personnel du Secrétaire Général face à cette situation qui est très préoccupante et, disons-le, dangereuse. Très préoccupante sur le plan humanitaire et dangereuse car la région risque un embrasement. Notre Conseil doit désormais agir et exercer ses responsabilités. C'est son devoir, c'est notre devoir. Nous avons le devoir de condamner sans aucune ambiguïté l'attaque terroriste du Hamas et d'autres groupes terroristes contre Israël. Une attaque massive, inhumaine et abominable. Une attaque contre des civils, assassinés de sang froid, torturés, violés. Personne ne peut contester la réalité qui est que le 7 octobre, le Hamas, groupe terroriste, a lancé une offensive contre un État membre des Nations Unies, Israël. Ce terrorisme a aussi frappé la France. 30 des nôtres ont perdu la vie et 9 autres sont portés disparus ou sont retenus en otage. Je réitère notre demande que tous les otages soient libérés immédiatement et sans condition. Des enfants dont des Français sont aujourd'hui probablement otages à Gaza. Personne au sein de ce Conseil ne doit l'accepter. Tous les otages doivent être libérés. Face à cette attaque, je veux ici rappeler la solidarité de la France avec Israël et son soutien constant à sa sécurité. Israël a le droit à la sécurité, Israël a le droit de se défendre et de protéger sa population pour que jamais une telle attaque ne puisse se reproduire. Le président de la République l'a rappelé à nouveau ce jour en Israël. Je m'y étais rendu il y a neuf jours et vu la douleur et la peine du peuple israélien. Israël a le droit de se défendre et le devoir de le faire dans le respect du droit international, en particulier du droit international humanitaire, et donc de protéger les populations civiles. Nous savons tous aussi que le Hamas ne représente en rien les Palestiniens. Dans la bande de Gaza, où le Hamas domine par la terreur et tient la population en otage, il n'apporte que la souffrance de la violence des combats et une crise humanitaire terrible. Face à cette crise humanitaire, notre devoir, y compris celui d'Israël, est de garantir la fourniture continue aux civils, dont des femmes et des enfants de Gaza, des biens de première nécessité, de l'eau, de la nourriture, des médicaments, du carburant. La vie des civils doit être préservée. Toute perte de vie civile est une tragédie. Et pour cela, nous devons garantir un accès humanitaire sûr, rapide et sans entrave, mais aussi durable à la bande de Gaza. Nous devons faire respecter le droit international humanitaire et ses principes que je rappelle. Humanité, neutralité, impartialité et indépendance. Enfin, nous devons demander la mise en place d'une trêve humanitaire qui pourra mener à terme à un cessez-le-feu. Je l'ai rappelé vendredi dernier au Caire, lors du sommet pour la paix organisé par l'Égypte, dont je salue ici les efforts. Et la Première ministre l'a rappelé hier au Parlement français. Depuis samedi, plusieurs convois humanitaires ont pu passer à travers le point de passage de Rafah. Ils doivent continuer d'entrer, plus nombreux. Le secrétaire général des Nations Unies l'a bien dit, l'entrée de ces camions est une question de vie ou de mort pour les habitants de la bande de Gaza. Leur nombre doit augmenter. Il faut faire plus, car les besoins sont immenses. Chaque civil compte, chaque minute compte. La France est engagée pour faire face à l'urgence humanitaire. Comme l'Union européenne, elle a augmenté son aide aux populations. Depuis le 7 octobre, elle a apporté 20 millions d'euros d'aide humanitaire supplémentaire pour la population de Gaza à travers l'action des agences des Nations unies, 
mais aussi les ICR et les ONG humanitaires. Je leur rends hommage, ainsi qu'à l'action déterminée du secrétaire général. La France affrète également un vol spécial avec 50 tonnes d'aide humanitaire d'urgence pour les Palestiniens pour accompagner les efforts de l'Égypte que nous encourageons. Le total de notre aide aux populations palestiniennes atteindra ainsi en 2023 plus de 110 millions d'euros. Nous avons par ailleurs le devoir d'empêcher un embrasement de toute la région. La France est engagée pour éviter une extension de ce conflit. Certains acteurs doivent s'abstenir de tenter de tirer profit de la situation actuelle. Nous le leur disons de la façon la plus nette. Nous les mettons en garde contre toute tentative d'immixion dans le conflit qui créerait un engrenage. Un embrasement ne profiterait à personne, ni dans la région, ni au-delà. Monsieur le Président, la gravité de la situation nous le rappelle et l'exige. Parmi nos devoirs, nous avons le devoir impérieux de retracer un chemin de paix. Nous devons agir pour recréer les conditions propices à une solution politique durable, à même de répondre aux aspirations légitimes des Palestiniens et des Israéliens à vivre en paix, non pas face à face, mais côte à côte. Les conditions de cette paix durable sont connues. Ce sont des garanties indispensables apportées à Israël pour sa sécurité et un État pour les Palestiniens. La seule solution viable est une solution à deux États. C'est ce que la France a toujours défendu et qu'elle continuera de défendre. Je l'ai rappelé au Caire samedi. Le président Macron le redit aujourd'hui aux Israéliens, aux Palestiniens et aux partenaires régionaux. Nous devons continuer d'apporter notre soutien à l'autorité palestinienne et même la conforter en vue d'une relance décisive du processus politique avec les uns et les autres. Le président de la République a ainsi voulu se rendre à Ramallah aujourd'hui, après ses entretiens à Tel Aviv et Jérusalem. Il vient d'y arriver et rencontre le président Abbas en ce moment même. Mais nous devons tous nous mobiliser afin de parvenir à retrouver un horizon politique. Ce Conseil doit pouvoir exercer pleinement sa responsabilité à cet égard, il est plus que temps qu'il condamne sans ambiguïté l'attaque terroriste du Hamas contre Israël, qu'il appelle au respect du droit international, y compris humanitaire, et qu'il demande la délivrance durable de l'aide à la population de Gaza. C'est pourquoi la France a voté en faveur du projet de résolution présenté par le Brésil, que je remercie de son engagement et de ses efforts. Et c'est pourquoi elle continuera de soutenir toute initiative du Conseil qui soit juste, et fondé sur nos principes communs. Ce Conseil doit agir maintenant. Monsieur le Président, la Charte des Nations Unies est entrée en vigueur il y a 78 ans aujourd'hui. Nous sommes ici pour la servir et pour servir la paix. En ces jours difficiles, la France appelle chacun à ses responsabilités devant la Charte et devant les hommes. Je vous remercie. I thank His Excellency Ms. Colonna for her statement. And now I give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Michel Onanga Ndiaye, Minister for Foreign Affairs of Gabon. Thank you, Mr. President. Monsieur le Président, je voudrais d'abord vous remercier d'avoir organisé ce débat public ministériel à un moment où la situation au Moyen-Orient ne cesse de s'aggraver et requiert la plus grande attention de la communauté internationale. Je voudrais saisir cette opportunité pour vous féliciter également pour la présidence de votre pays, le Brésil, en ce mois d'octobre. Je voudrais me féliciter également de la participation à ce débat de M. le secrétaire général Antonio Guterres, et salue ses efforts en faveur du processus de paix au Moyen-Orient. J'ai suivi avec une grande attention les exposés édifiants du coordonnateur spécial, M. Thor Wedesland, et de la coordonnatrice spéciale adjointe pour le processus de paix au Moyen-Orient, en charge également de la coordination des affaires humanitaires pour le territoire palestinien occupé, Mme Lynn Hastings. Les attaques effroyables du Hamas en Israël le 7 octobre dernier marque un point nouveau de basculement dans le conflit israélo-palestinien. 
Le bilan des combats entre Israël et le Hamas s'alourdit chaque jour et de façon vertigineuse, avec des milliers de morts et de blessés, des personnes enlevées, des atrocités commises à l'encontre des femmes, enfants et des personnes âgées. Le Gabon, mon pays, réitère sa ferme condamnation de ces actes de barbarie et exhorte les ravisseurs à remettre en liberté tous les otages. La libération de deux otages de nationalité américaine le 20, le 20 octobre, puis de deux autres de nationalité israélienne hier, est un motif d'encouragement. Nous reconnaissons le droit d'Israël à la légitime défense, mais dans le respect du principe de proportionnalité, de précaution et de distinction. Avec le siège à Gaza, la détresse humaine a atteint une échelle insoutenable. Les frappes aériennes indiscriminées ont fait des milliers de morts et de destructions, sans mesure en quelques jours. Les attaques récentes contre l'église orthodoxe et l'hôpital d'Ayara de Gaza sont de ce fait le terrible reflet d'une escalade de violence qui n'a plus de limites. Le Gabon, mon pays, condamne la violence contre les infrastructures de nature civile en rappelant que les unités sanitaires et leur personnel doivent être respectés et protégés en toutes circonstances conformément aux droits international humanitaires. C'est le lieu de, de rendre un vibrant hommage, hommage aux travailleurs et travailleuses humanitaires qui exercent leurs activités avec dévouement dans des conditions souvent hostiles au péril de leur vie. Toujours sur le plan humanitaire, nous suivons avec intérêt le cheminement de l'aide vers la bande de Gaza au point de passage de Rafa, qui a débuté le 21 octobre. Il s'agit, de mon point de vue, d'une lueur d'espoir pour des millions de populations de Gaza prises dans l'étau des belligérants, piégées sans eau potable, denrées alimentaires, gaz, carburant et électricité. Nous saluons à cet effet les efforts de l'Égypte et des États-Unis et lançons un appel pour une ouverture en continu de ce point de passage au vu de la situation critique sur le terrain. Monsieur le Président, mis face à ces responsabilités, notre Conseil n'a malheureusement pas pu supporter ces clivages. Le Gabon, mon pays, a voté en faveur des deux derniers projets de résolution, animés par le profond désir de mettre fin aux exactions et de protéger les populations civiles. Nous regrettons que notre Conseil n'ait pu parvenir à un consensus. L'arrêt immédiat des hostilités et un accès sans entrave à l'aide humanitaire aux populations dans le besoin et des urgences vitales, sont des urgences vitales. Pour moi. Nous devons œuvrer davantage pour faire taire les armes et trouver une solution durable à la dimension de la gravité de cette crise. Le Gabon plan pense qu'il est plus que temps que la place de l'humain soit au-dessus des alliances politiques et géopolitiques. Il est évident que le conflit actuel ne saurait être appréhendé uniquement à l'aune des événements de ces derniers jours. L'examen des causes profondes de ce conflit est une urgente nécessité. La, pours la poursuite de la politique d'expansion des colonies, les démolitions et expul expulsions, notamment dans la Cisjordanie occupée, y compris Jérusalem-Est, le blocus de Gaza, les provocations à caractère religieux, les attaques terroristes sur le sol israélien, la récurrence des propos belliqueux auxquels s'ajoute le gel des fonds fiscaux collectés par Israël auprès des travailleurs d'autorité palestinienne pour le compte de cette dernière, constitue des obstacles majeurs à l'éducation d'une paix globale, juste et durable. Les violations manifestes du droit international et des résolutions du Conseil de sécurité, notamment les résolutions 1860 et 2334, doivent impérativement cesser. Eu égard à ce qui précède, le Gabon, mon pays, réaffirme son attachement à la solution à deux États, palestiniens et israéliens vivant côte à côte sur la base de frontières internationalement reconnues avec Jérusalem pour capitale. En outre, dans l'optique d'une coexistence pacifique des peuples israéliens et palestiniens, le Gabon rappelle également son, attache, son attachement au respect du statu quo des lieux saints de Jérusalem et reconnaît le rôle crucial du royaume de Jordanie en tant que gardien officiel des lieux saints musulmans de Jérusalem. Monsieur le Président, l'escalade des hostilités nous met face à un contexte de guerre dont l'impact sur la région est inéluctable. Nous nous devons de prévenir un enlisement de la situation 
et l'ouverture d'autres fronts dans la région, notamment sur Jordani, au sud du Liban, qui rendrait l'environnement régional encore plus volatile. Le Gabon prend note de la tenue au Caire du sommet pour la paix du 21 octobre dernier et exhorte les acteurs régionaux et internationaux ayant une influence sur les partis à appuyer davantage toutes les initiatives visant au dialogue et à la paix au Moyen-Orient. Pour terminer, Monsieur le Président, mon pays réaffirme en ce jour sacré des Nations Unies sa conviction profonde que seule la diplomatie, le dialogue et la négociation avec un rôle central des Nations Unies sont le canon incontournable pour parvenir à une solution durable à ce conflit, solution qui ferait prévaloir le droit du peuple palestinien à l'autodétermination et le droit légitime d'Israël à la sécurité. Je vous remercie. I thank His Excellency Mr. Onangan Ndiaye for his statement and I now give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Igli Hassani, Minister for Europe and Foreign Affairs of Albania. Thank you, Minister Vieira, for the invitation and for organizing this uh, high-level meeting. And thank you, Secretary General, and to the briefers for the sober description of the situation on the ground. The terrible events of October 7 represent the deadliest single attack on Israel's history. Albania stands with Israel, like with every other nation under attack, in its legitimate right to self-defense in accordance with international humanitarian law. In such difficult and defining moments, Israel and its people need the support of the community of free nations in responding to terrorists who have committed horrible crimes and continue to question its right to exist. We profoundly believe that there is a way to ensure the security of Israel and ensure the protection of innocent civilians. Innocent lives matter equally, be that Israeli or Palestinian. This is why every measure and every precaution must be taken not to harm those who don't deserve it, those whose lives have been put in danger by Hamas and other terrorists and extremists. Hamas, their leaders who live a comfortable life outside Gaza and their supporters knew very well what they were doing when they unleashed the beasts to kill, burn, massacre and kidnap everyone they could. They were hoping to trigger a massive response from Israel, knowing very well that civilians would be caught in the middle. Their hope and their win would be to make the world turn against Israel. But we must not be fooled. There is only one party that is rejoicing with what is happening. It is the country known to sponsor of terrorism in Gaza, in the West Bank, in Yemen, in Lebanon, in Syria, anywhere they can. It is the country that is known for and continues to destabilize the entire Middle East. Mr. President, Albania condemns any justification and glorification of the terrorist attacks. It is crystal clear that the aim of Hamas is not to protect the Palestinians. Their actions do not represent them. Therefore, it is high time for all Palestinians to realize that their fight to self-determination, their dream for statehood, their aspirations for a better life in security and dignity will never be realized with Hamas and the likes. They must be the first to turn against acts of horror, against the unacceptable and the unjustifiable. Hamas is denying them their present. It is stealing their future. Mr. President, developments in the Middle East have always resonated around the world. They unleash strong passions and emotions. We are worried by a frightening increase of the level of anti-Semitism, fueled by hatred, by misinformation and disinformation, propelled to very dangerous levels, in particular through the social media. Anti-Semitism has never disappeared, but what we see nowadays is simply unacceptable. We should not stay indifferent in face of calls and behaviors that come from the Nazi playbooks. We must not let the fabric of our societies be torn apart by misconceptions, by hate speech, by discrimination, and by reviving despicable behaviors that have produced one of the darkest moments in human history. We have said it never again, but we must keep it, be vigilant, react, fight for it against all those who fume the flames of division and discrimination. Dear members of the Security Council, as we heard, the humanitarian situation in Gaza is dramatic. 
We condemn the attack on the Al Ahli Hospital last Tuesday and call for full, full investigation of those responsible for such act. We welcome the arrangements made so far for the humanitarian convoys into Gaza with water, food and medical supplies. Although much more is needed to meet the needs, efforts must continue and diplomacy must always prevail. We commend the efforts of Egypt, the United States, Israel and the Secretary General in this respect. The humanitarian aid for civilians should flow unhindered to all those in need and the provision of fuel and restoration of electricity must be ensured. The normal and unhindered flow of humanitarian assistance must be guaranteed by humanitarian poses. We welcome the release of hostages and every effort in this respect deserves praise. Civilians should have never been kidnapped in the first place and all must be released unconditionally. Last but uh, by no means least, everything must be done to avoid the spillover of the conflict which would destabilize the entire Middle East. We condemn the Hezbollah attacks on Israel and call on them to refrain from unprovoked actions and fully comply with United Nations Security Council Resolution 1706. Provocative, threatening and inciting rhetoric do not help. It is time to act with maturity, with messages of caution and responsibility. Israel needs and deserves security. Palestinians need and deserve their state. The issue of Palestine should not continue to remain an unfinished business to poison international life and serve as a false pretext to the extremists and terrorists who use it for other aims and gains. There is urgent need to bring back a perspective for the future, especially for Gaza, once the hostilities are over. Albania reiterates its support for two states, for two peoples, democratic and viable Palestine and a secure Israel, living side by side in a peace and security and in full recognition with their people enjoying equal rights and equal dignity. In concluding, Mr. President, I would like to, to express Albania's uh, full support for the U.S. draft proposal that addresses all the core pertinent issues on which we hope the Security Council will show unity. And I thank you. I thank His Excellency Mr. Hassani for his statement. And I now give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Ian Borg, Minister for Europe and Foreign Affairs and Trade of Malta. Thank you, Mr. President. I also thank the Secretary General and uh, the previous in today's session. The situation in the Middle East has been precariously fragile and unsustainable for too long. Discussions in this chamber often focused on the violent escalations, unilateral measures, injustice, socio-economic inequality, human rights violation, dangerous rhetoric, hate speech, and other warning signs. It was evident that this volatile situation was pushing the conflict to a precarious edge. Our worst fears were realized on 7th October, when Hamas committed a despicable and deplorable terror attack against Israel, which we have condemned without reservation. The situation has now already resulted in the deaths of thousands and affected thousands more. Malta acknowledges Israel's right to self-defense and its duty and responsibility to protect its people. At the same time, we also emphasize that such actions must be consistent with obligations under international humanitarian law and in line with the principles of distinction and proportionality. Mr. President, at the beginning of the current crisis, we had underlined the need for steps in the right direction. In this context, we welcome the news that four hostages have been released and greatly appreciate the efforts by all involved to this end. We call on Hamas to release all remaining hostages safely and unconditionally and without further delay. We are also gravely concerned at the current humanitarian situation in Gaza. Thousands of Palestinians have been killed, many of whom are civilians, including women and children. Scores more are likely still buried under the rubble of leveled neighborhoods. Malta condemns all attacks against civilians, UN, medical and humanitarian workers, religious places, as well as civilian infrastructure. We call for an independent investigation into the blast at Al Ahli Baptist Hospital on the 18th of October 
and we stress that whoever is responsible must be held accountable. International humanitarian law must be respected by all. We are deeply concerned by the decision taken by Israel to cut off the supply of water, electricity, food and fuel into Gaza. This action is resulting in dire humanitarian consequences for the civilian population. It will inevitably lead to a public health catastrophe due to compounding effects of mass displacement, inadequate sanitation and waterborne diseases. Parties must adhere to their obligations to allow the safe, rapid, unimpeded and sustained delivery of humanitarian aid through the Rafa crossings and to establish humanitarian corridors and safe zones. We commend efforts made by the United Nations, the United States and Egypt in this regard. We must also note that this conflict has already had a disproportionate effect on women and children on both sides. Over 200 people, including women and children, are being held hostage by Hamas. Internally displaced women and girls in Gaza are at an elevated risk of gender-based violence, including sexual and psychological violence. It is in view of these extraordinary levels of suffering that Malta strongly reiterates its call for the establishment of an immediate humanitarian pause. Mr. President, the legitimate aspirations of the Palestinian people should not be confused with the terroristic group of Hamas. It is crucial that this distinction is made clear to all to avoid further inflammatory polarization and potentials of regional escalation. Neither can we lose sight of the West Bank. Since the 7th of October, killing, violence and forced displacement of Palestinians has seen a sharp increase, including through settler violence and hundreds of arrests. We call on parties to de-escalate and exercise the utmost restraint. Avoiding further conflict fronts, particularly on the Israeli-Lebanese border and in the West Bank, is crucial for regional peace. Parties with influence must take steps to achieve dialogue which promotes peace. In this vein, I would like to once again recall the importance of adequate measures to suppress the financing of terrorism, ensuring that terrorist groups do not have access to financing is a basic condition for promoting peace. In closing, Mr. President, Malta remains committed to a lasting and sustainable peace in the Middle East. A peace which is based on a two-state solution along the pre-1967 borders, addressing the legitimate aspirations of both sides, with Jerusalem as the future capital of two states, living side by side in peace and security, in line with the relevant Security Council resolutions and internationally agreed parameters. I reiterate our call for de-escalation and ensuring the safe and immediate release of all hostages. Ultimately, the only viable path towards peace remains clear. A just and comprehensive resolution of the conflict where violent acts have no place. I thank you. I thank His Excellency Mr. Borg for his statement. I now give the floor to Her Excellency Ms. Maya Tisafi, State Secretary of Switzerland. Monsieur le Président, Excellence, je tiens à vous remercier pour l'organisation de ce débat ouvert sur la situation au Moyen-Orient. Je remercie aussi le secrétaire général, le coordinateur spécial Tour Venezland et de son adjointe, Madame Lynn Hastings, pour leur intervention importante. La présence de nombreux ministres des Affaires étrangères et d'autres hauts représentants d'États membres témoigne la gravité du moment. Excellence, la Suisse, pays dépositaire de Convention de Genève, a fait de la protection des civils et du respect du droit international humanitaire une priorité de son mandat au Conseil de sécurité. Nous nous engageons pour un Conseil qui, même dans l'urgence et surtout dans l'urgence, fait du respect du droit international humanitaire une priorité. Dès le 7 octobre, 
la Suisse a fermement condamné les actes de terreur, le dire indiscriminé des croquettes contre la population israélienne et les prises d'otages menées par le Hamas. Tous les otages retenus à Gaza doivent être traités humainement et libérés de manière immédiate et inconditionnelle. Nous, en, nous avons, dès le début de cette crise, également reconnu la volonté légitime de défense et de sécurité nationale d'Israël, le droit international légitime de défendre et de sécurité nationale d'Israël. Le droit international humanitaire prend en compte la sécurité légitime et la nécessité militaire. Nous rappelons aux partis de caractère obligatoire de toutes ces règles, sans exception, en particulier les principes de distinction, de proportionnalité et de précaution dans les conduites de hostilité. Avant même le 7 octobre, nous évoquions au sein de ce Conseil le nombre de morts qui atteignait déjà des records effrayants. Nous déplorons aujourd'hui les victimes des actes de terreur de Hamas, ainsi que la mort de milliers de civils, dont des milliers d'enfants en Israël et dans tous les territoires palestiniens occupés, y compris Jérusalem-Est. Nous présentons nos plus sincères condoléances à leurs proches. La semaine dernière, de nombreuses personnes ont été tuées ou blessées lorsque l'hôpital Al-Ali à Gaza a été touché. La Suisse est jointe au secrétaire général dans une condamnation sans équivoque. Elle a demandé qu'une enquête soit menée afin que les faits soient éclaircis. Monsieur le Président, il faut impérativement protéger les civils et les personnes qui, se, qui ne participent plus aux hostilités. Il faut les protéger des actes de terreur en Israël. Il faut les protéger à Gaza et en Zichordanie, où l'augmentation des violences...